Come on! Want you to try a game of mine. Hey, Raymond. It's got options for co-op, too. Which difficulty? Explore. Explore! Forget it! Play tactician! Gifted Grey here for Baldur's Gate 3, Divinity Original Sin Edition. Are you eager to experience the full depth of Larian's masterpiece? But you're terrified to play the tactical RPG on its tactical setting. You're a human trash can, your partner's cheating on you, and your kids refuse to look you in the eyes. Because you don't have Gifted, Gifted Grey's spoiler-free fundamentals to tactician. Tactician is important because the lesser difficulties gut immersive enemy behaviors like using items, prioritizing targets, and considering environmental factors. If it's too overwhelming, you're always free to turn the difficulty down. But if you follow my simple ABCs to tactical success, you're not going to find the game hard at all. The game's going to find you hard. Hey! Ability scores. Bulldor's Great isn't a complicated game. It's just built on top of Dungeons & Dragons 5th edition rule set, a tabletop experience where people roleplay and jiggle their dice in front of one another. Much of the video game's mechanics are still conveyed in D&D nomenclature. Attributes are called ability scores, and abilities are always checked with a d20, which is shorthand for a 20-sided die. And you're going to die a lot if those d20 rolls aren't boosted to overcome difficulty class, which is the number to beat when your abilities are checked. When creating your character, make sure your ability scores are even, because odd numbers are trash. Every two ability score above 10 contributes a plus one bonus to your d20 rolls. You can max one score at 17, but you'll only receive the same plus three modifier that you would get from having 16. So don't bother. Your primary ability score will be marked with a star, so make sure that ability always gets its sweet 16. If charisma and intelligence aren't your primary abilities, feel free to dump those scores to 8 so you'll have more points to invest elsewhere. These stats are rarely used on spell saves, and if you're not a charisma focused class, just let a charismatic companion do the talking. Constitution is great for barbarians because they use its modifier to boost their armor class, making them more difficult to damage. Constitution is also nice once you have a few levels under your belt, but before that point, it's quite lackluster. You'll gain the opportunity to reclass and change your ability scores pretty early, so I would hold off on overinvesting in Constitution at level 1. Constitution also modifies your concentration saves, but not all spells require concentration, and you have to take damage while concentrating before those saves take place. Concentration is the ontological state of channeling certain spells and you can see when the mechanic is required by surveying the casting tooltips. In game, your character's concentration is represented on the bottom left, which is important to check because characters can only channel one concentration spell at a time. It's also helpful to organize your spell bar as your casting repertoire grows, separating your concentration spells and checking the bottom left to prevent canceling out one persistent spell for another. Before we move on to the other ability scores, it's important to understand proficiencies. Proficiencies are determined by your character's class and race, and they're listed on the right-hand side of the character creation menu. Being proficient with a weapon gives your attack rolls a plus two bonus at level one, increasing to plus four by max level. If you're a caster, the same goes for your casting. A plus two at level one, on top of your ability score modifier, added to your d20 rolls against difficulty difficulty class. Melee weapons are modified by strength unless they're noted as finesse weapons. Finesse weapons and ranged weapons are modified by dexterity. Armor proficiencies are a big deal when it comes to optimal ability scoring, because when enemies are rolling to attack you, your armor class is the number they need to beat. You can obtain a high armor class with any armor proficiencies, but wearing armor you're not proficient with comes with severe penalties, so don't do it. In order to get armor class as high as possible, you'll need to consider your 
armor proficiencies and set your dexterity ability score accordingly. Heavy armor proficiency is great for strength based classes, but wearing heavy armor doesn't give you any bonus to AC from dexterity. The only problem is classes proficient in heavy armor don't start out wearing heavy armor. Medium armor allows for a plus two AC modifier from dexterity, and this is the heaviest armor that any class starts the game with. So if you're proficient in heavy or medium armor, you're going to want at least 14 dexterity. Light armor and clothing doesn't bridle your dexterity bonus to AC at all, leaving your character light on their feet and free to dodge incoming attacks. I recommend going 16 dexterity with light armor proficiencies in order to maximize your AC and reduce your odds of taking consistent damage. Dexterity also increases your difficulty class on area of effect spells, as well as abilities that challenge your character's balance, all of which are quite commonplace in battle. But another bonus to dex is found in initiative, promoting your turn order in combat. Getting to strike before your enemies is a huge advantage. It allows you to control the fight, killing or disabling enemies before they can even respond in many cases. If strength isn't your main ability, there's still a few reasons not to dump the stat. Even as a caster or finesse fighter, for one, strength is tied to your jump distance. And there are some parts of the game where having less than 10 strength can leave a party member stranded. There are potions of vaulting and other workarounds, but since strength is also tethered to inventory capacity and shoving, I never drop it below 10 personally. Shove has a ton of versatility, not only because many of the areas have verticality, meaning you can shove enemies from on high and watch them plummet to their deaths, but also because nearby enemies receive attacks of opportunity when you try to move party members away. Shove is a bonus action, so you can attack or cast a spell and push combatants off your allies all in a single turn. Wisdom is another ability score that I prefer not to drop to 8, even if it's not a casting ability for my character. Wisdom is the most common spell save modifier. Almost every spell that fears, dominates, holds, or otherwise controls your party members will attempt to overcome wisdom as a spell save. Wisdom, dexterity, and constitution are far more important in regard to spell protection than intellect, charisma, and strength are. As a matter of fact, if you combined all the spells together that challenge intellect, charisma, and strength, they wouldn't equal half the amount of spells that challenge constitution. And dexterity and wisdom are used as DC for more spells than constitution is. If you're creating a monk, your wisdom bonus even contributes to your armor class. So you'll need 16 dexterity and 16 wisdom to have decent starting AC. I cannot overemphasize the importance of armor class and tactician. I just can't. The enemies hit hard, so we've got to reduce those odds. It gets better late game in some respects when constitution gets its button gear, but early on any enemy can down you in a couple of hits, so it has to be prioritized right behind your primary ability score. The primary ability score for bards is charisma, but their early game cantrips are the worst for damage. Cantrips are spells you can use every turn without rest so they are the spells you can use consistently. I wanted to advise bard players to not only go 16 charisma, but to grab 16 dexterity as well. You can use ranged and finesse weapons to close that early game damage gap. Half casters are primarily martial classes, which means their weapon modifiers support most of their functionality. Charisma on a paladin is only going to modify healing and spells like command with difficulty class. The more commonly used offensive abilities like smite tag onto your weapon modifier, and buffs have no difficulty class to roll against. Rangers only use wisdom to modify a few spells, so don't feel obligated to overinvest in their casting early game. A character's class and background will also provide you with skills. Many of these skills provide narrative options, but some are better than others when it comes to succeeding on tactician. Athletics and acrobatics provide shove resist, and we already covered how powerful shoving is. Perception is great for spotting things, hidden items and doors, which you would otherwise not gain access to. Sleight of hand disarms traps, picks locks, and empties pockets, so make sure you have a dexterous party member for that. Persuasion is also a bit better than intimidation, if you ask me, because failing to intimidate someone usually leads to violence. Wrapping up this section on ability scores, remember odd scores are trash. Sweet 16 your primaries, consider your proficiencies, and maximize your armor class. 
class. Don't dump strength, dexterity, constitution, or wisdom, but feel free to dump intellect and charisma if they're not your casting abilities. B. Build a diverse party. Look, I don't want to make this political, but I know you probably hang with a crew, and your circle probably thinks, speaks, and behaves similarly. It's okay, I'm not judging. But taking Faerun on the hardest setting is all about progression, and nothing is more progressive than building a diverse party. We've already covered a few skills and explained how they open up narrative options. Strength only modifies athletics, which is associated with shove mechanics, and constitution doesn't modify narrative skills at all. So if we remove those ability scores, we only have four left. Charisma, Dexterity, Intellect, and Wisdom all have several skills associated with them. And if you want to get the most out of your playthrough, it's nice to have a range. In Act 1, you will run into a Fighter, Barbarian, Warlock, Wizard, Rogue, and Cleric. This information isn't a spoiler. The origin characters are literally displayed in character creation. Creator. Consider the classes available and try to split the focus of your ability scores between your four members so you'll have access to a variety of solutions while addressing the difficulty class of narrative events and defeating your enemies in combat. If you're used to having tanks and tactical RPGs, that's not really a thing on Tactician. I still recommend having a mix of melee and ranged party members for reasons we'll go over in the next section. C. Context. Now that you have a diverse party capitalizing on spells, skills, and martial attacks that source their power from different ability scores, we're ready to face Tactician and wreck our enemies. There's only one thing we're missing, and it's the most important thing involved in any decision making. Context. You're going to have conflicts to resolve in game, and if you approach them all in the exact same way, you're not a approaching them tactically. Anytime I encounter a new enemy type, the very first thing I do is creep their personal profile. You can examine your enemies, study them, and use your prefrontal cortex to reason your approach. Attack them where it hurts most, on their lowest difficulty classes. Some enemies have high armor class, but they lack the wisdom and dexterity to stay on their feet. Have a cleric or paladin command them to grovel, or use grease to lay them flat on their backs, making them easier for your allies to damage. Concentrate on a bless spell to boost those attack rolls. Examine your enemies and use your spells in context. The game gives you all the information you need, you just have to peep those deets. In a game with only 12 levels, it's no surprise that level differences are huge. Even an enemy two levels higher than you can down a party member in a single attack. On Tactician, especially early game, it's a good idea to sweep around the starting area to gain levels before going too far in any one direction. Save often, and if you bite off more than you can chew, explore elsewhere until you're strong enough for the challenge. Every character can move, use an action, a bonus action, and have a reaction every turn. Your enemies will also have their turns to take, so it's important to maximize your action economy whilst diminishing your enemies. Typically, two enemies at 10% health are more dangerous than a single enemy with full health, because two enemies have double the action economy. Think in terms of reducing enemy actions and quickly, through slaughtering and controlling them with spells. If you get outnumbered and can't reduce enemy action count quickly, use line of sight, or consider your party's toolkit. Cast sleep, or destroy low health enemies first. Use your action, bonus action, and set up for reactions on every turn, in order to dominate your enemies with greater efficiency. Attacks of opportunity are melee reactions that provide an edge, so stack allies on enemies as they engage your group, especially if the enemies are using ranged weapons. If they try to move away or pass within range of your melee fighters, they will receive an attack of opportunity. A hit that would otherwise cost you a turn action is now gained as a reaction. Even if you have ranged characters, switching their weapons to melee is free, so be sure to take advantage of this before ending the turn. If you've maximized armor class as I instructed, 
constructed earlier, everyone can get their hands dirty a bit and maximize their action economy with attacks of opportunity. There are times when you'll be overwhelmed by masses of weaker enemies. This is why the game provides us with casters. My favorite for area burst damage is the Sorcerer, because with their meta magic quicken spell, you can cast two fireballs in a single turn. This absolutely roasts entire rooms of enemies. Going back to party diversity, you'll want to have a nice split of martial and caster classes, with area of effect damage and control spells. Advantage and disadvantage also add a ton of context to this game. If you have advantage on attack rolls, you get to roll twice and take the highest value. If you have disadvantage, you get the worst of two rolls. Needless to say, you're going to want to take advantage of this mechanic in context. If you're hidden, or your target is blind, if the enemy is knocked prone, paralyzed, or even if you have the high ground, you will gain advantage on your attack rolls. Enemies have these same advantages, so ranged attackers with high ground should be priority when you're considering your next move. All that armor class we stacked isn't going to matter if we're at a disadvantage. The developers went through and added a litany of environmental hazards just for tactician. There are grenades, bombs, barrels, and environmental hazards throughout the Sword Coast. Be wary, but also willing to exploit these elements to your advantage. Having a charismatic party member de-escalate a confrontation not only gives you non-violent experience, but often gives you time to set up and stage these hazards. Sabotaging the field of battle before an ambush isn't cheating, even though it can feel that way at times. Another important technique to understand is the skillful art of save scumming. You can quick save and quick load using F5 and F8, and I recommend you quick save a lot. How much? Well, I quick save neurotically before every narrative role in combat encounter. Every time I trade or loot an entire area, I use my F5 and F8 keys so much that they're worn of their labels. Sure, you can just accept failed dice rolls, and there is a case for that making the game more fun, but if you're like me, you like to get what you want and leave nothing to chance. Save scumming makes any roll arbitrary, as you can always try and try again until you inevitably get what you want. This also relieves much of the frustration in combat, as an unlucky roll or bad start is just one F8 away from being reset. By default, the game stacks dozens of these quick save files, but be careful because the game also clears them. If you want a save to remain long term, you'll need to manually save and label it in the game menu. Before I leave to start working on my next episode, I also wanted to talk about manually entering turn-based mode. You can do this whenever you like. It's particularly useful when you're sneaking around, robbing townspeople blind, stopping time stops their wandering eyes, and you can loot a locked chest and stealth in a single turn. This is also useful before difficult fights, where you want to maximize buffing before action economy comes into play. Many buffs only last for 10 turns, so buffing in turn-based mode before triggering combat can provide an edge. Thanks so much for stopping by for this deconstruction of Boldor's Great. It's really an excellent Excellent game, and I can tell I'm going to play through it several times to experience all the dynamic narrative aspects. If you want to join me for some co-op, hit me up on my socials. If you have any other tactical tips or questions, leave a comment below. And if you don't want to miss out on future content, be sure to subscribe, because I can't wait to show you the very next episode of Gifted Grey Deconstructed.